Your Creative Push, Episode 2. Believe in what you're doing. Believe in what you're doing and just do it. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I am your host, Young Men Brown, and my guest today is Carl Martins. Carl's a painter from Sweden with a special interest in nature, specifically birds. Carl's style comes from his interest for the forms of meditation found in Zen Buddhism, and he believes that the first brushstroke is the most important. Carl, tell me what I missed in that intro and maybe give us a peek into your personal life. Well, you didn't miss so much. Um, I, I can just say that I grew, I'm actually born in, this, in, this, in San Francisco, so I'm actually American also. Uh, I just happened to grow up in Sweden, and I left for Switzerland, and then I went, went for Canada, and, um, and then I lived in San Francisco again for a while. And um, other than my painting, I, I, I'm a graphic designer. I worked as a graphic designer for about 33 years, in both in, in Toronto and San Francisco and Stockholm. And I moved to Sweden because of my love for my new, or my, shall we say, my new love in Sweden. Or it isn't so new, it's 17 years old now, but that's why I'm in Sweden. Anyway. So that's about it. Uh, could you take us back to uh, your first or maybe one of your first creative moments uh, and tell us that story? Well, the, yeah, the, um, I've been painting birds my whole life and studying birds my whole life. And I've been sort of on weekends and evenings, I've been plodding away, to painting all the birds uh, that I could find. And just sort of in a way to try to reproduce them, because I, I just find them so incredible. And you look at their feathers and so forth. And, and I wanted to reproduce that and sort of have a, an exact uh, image of it. And this just went on and on and on. And I, for some reason, I was never I was never happy with it. I looked at them and said, well, those are fine. And, and my people who looked at them said, yeah, that's very nice, and nothing really came out of it. But then uh, when I started with something I call Zen calligraphy, which is a sort of practice with my teacher, Alok Tzu Kuan Han, who, where we paint nothing, we just sort of go for it, um, that made me understand how I was looking at life. I was trying to control my painting. I was looking at the birds and I said, it's got to be, when I paint it, it has to be this particular way and it has to be that particular way and I have to show this and that. And so I, that's what I was doing all my life. So in a sense, I was a control freak and I probably am a control freak. But during this process with the sand calligraphy, I sort of came in touch with another way of, of looking at things, which is not to be so concerned with what I was painting and sort of just daring to paint. But at, what happened was that I was, even though I was studying the sand calligraphy, I was still doing my detailed birds. And I'd been spending a week on a little bird, a little uh, a bird called a ruff. And I painted, I, it, it's a fun bird because it has feathers that you can almost paint any color you want. So I sort of was having some fun with it. And then when I was ready, after about a week, I looked at it and I, and I took a look in a bird book just to sort of check if I had done the right thing. And I had forgotten that they have a short beak and I painted a long beak. And for some reason, this kind of, I just lost it. And I said, this is ridiculous. So I tore the thing up, threw it away, and I took out a paintbrush that I'd been painting the walls with, just a regular broad paintbrush. I dipped it in some black paint and I sort of just made a big circle, sort of, as I was doing in my Zen calligraphy class, I just sort of made a circle and sort of splashed it on there. And I looked at this thing, and there was sort of a little area that wasn't filled in, and I looked at it, and I put in a little face of a coot, which is a little black bird with a white face. And all of a sudden, there was a bird. And all of a sudden, this bird was sort of looking at me, and I looked at it and said, I like this. Hmm. I kind of... I had no idea what I had done, sort of, but I sort of just took it one more step and I put a face on there, and all of a sudden it was a bird, and, and it was kind of fun because it was just a surprise for me that, that that this could happen. So I tried this again, a little bit more, and a little bit more, and I painted some some paintings, and 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 I, I liked them, and people came to look at them, and they bought them, and so I just sort of <laughs> realized that first of all I had made my painted my first Zen painting. And also, um, people started enjoying it, and I enjoyed it. So that was sort of the kickstart to my new way of painting, 
which is completely different from this detailed stuff. However, I get to keep my control freak attitude because I work on the faces, on the birds, very, very much detail. So I get, I get both of the best of both worlds. I love it. And would you say that you have mastered that at this point? No. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, think, I I would say that you have, by the way. <laughs> they, they're amazing. I, I can't. I and I can't. And you and you do it from from memory too, uh, which is it just shocked me because they're so lifelike. Well, I, having after you know fifty five years or close to sixty years of studying birds and drawing birds, uh, I kind of that's the re- the reason I paint birds is because at least I don't have to worry about what they look like. I know what they look like. Now, I look at birds, and I look at films of birds, and I have every bird book in the world and so forth. So, so I mean, I, get, I still get input, and I see things, and I sit here in my studio and look out over the trees, and there's a bird, and it does something, and, and then I want to capture that. So, so I, the reason I can do it from the memory is just I've, I've studied them so much that I really know. Even if I, maybe I don't see a particular owl or something, like that, but I know them so well that if I see another owl, I can make it into whatever owl I want. So it's just practice, that's all. I love it. And I also know that you're into, um, how do you say it, Kyoto? Kyudo. Kyudo, okay. Kyudo. And, uh, and well, maybe you could explain for the audience um, what that is and, and how that, it, how that uh, also relates to your painting, because I, th- I think that's very interesting as well. Well, it actually relates better to my painting than, my, than trying to describe my painting. Actually, it's interesting, yeah, that's true. <laughs> It's interesting because it's it's the Jap you know, kudo Japanese archery and what you do this it's sort of a ceremonial way of using a bow, and the ceremony, the ceremony it takes ten minutes to to uh, shoot two arrows. Oh my goodness! And the point is that the whole ceremony puts you in a frame of mind and you so that you concentrate only on the step at which you're at. You you have to have your hands. You come in the room and you bow and you go and sit down and sometimes you take part of your kimono off and then you bow again and you move forward within a group and everything, every single detail is controlled. Where you have your fingers, where you have your feet, where you have your head, everything is terribly controlled so that you really have no chance of thinking about anything else but what you're doing right at that moment. And the purpose, if one could say that, is to be so involved in doing all the movements right that at the point of standing with uh, your bow fully drawn, it's a big long bow, it's, it's way over six feet and fairly strong and the, and the target is far away and fairly small, to stand there with a fully drawn bow and not think about hitting the target. It's very, very difficult, but if you can do all the movements correctly, you can actually hit the target in the dark and there's a youtube of that where a master japanese master shoots in the dark and hits the target right in the center so it's not a matter of aiming it's a matter of trusting your instincts and your knowledge your intuition so to speak fully so that you do things correctly and that's sort of how the painting works as well where where i try to not think about what i'm doing i'm following the paintbrush and letting my intuition work so they're very similar in that sense. The Kudo helped my painting and vice versa, actually. Where you call it no mind, or mushin in Japanese, which means no mind, where you, you just focus on the moment as it is. I do a little exercise each time I paint. I, I, doing it in, in Kudo is much more difficult because it's also very uh, physically demanding because the bow is strong and so forth. But in the painting, um, do you want to do a little exercise? Sure. I, I was just going to ask you uh, what I could do because as a writer, I mean, that's my head is always spinning. What What are people going to think? What, yeah. am, I, am I writing this correctly? Is this the correct grammar? And uh, mm. it's so hard to let go. Um, yeah, I would love to. Okay. So all you need to do is a little bit of meditation. Uh, I'll do it fairly short. But um, if you let's say you are, since I'm painting out while we're related to painting, so let's say you're going to paint an image. So what I'd like you to do is just to sit mm-hmm. and just focus on your breathing, just for a, for a second. Nothing but your breathing. You don't have to change anything because of the breathing, you know how to do it. Just breathe and then follow the air in and out of your body. Just 
And I'm going to give you an image for your mind. And I want you to notice what happens in your mind when I give you this image. Okay? Mm -hmm. So just breathe and listen. The image is a sparkling winter day. A sparkling winter day. And just notice what happens in your mind. Everything that comes along. And then you go back to your breathing. Focus on your breathing and try to notice what happens in your mind. I'll give you one more image just so that you get practice of this. Okay. Just breathe and listen. Swans by the lake shore. Swans by the lake shore. Just notice what happened. Then you go back to your breathing and notice what happens then. And then you can come back to our conversation. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> what I, my question is to you, when you get this image, and I gave you the image, what happened in your mind? Uh, for the, the winter image, I saw, I saw a landscape of, uh, like a snowy, uh, like a snowy house, like a house and actually maybe a lake and, and snow, snow covered trees. And then I saw the snow melting into like a river mm -hmm. and it was calm. It was very calming. Did your mind go elsewhere? Did you get associations? And uh, I, I saw a lot of white, and I started like going down the river with, with the melting snow. Okay, okay. And what happened with these images when you started going back to your breathing? Uh, they started to go away. Mm. They faded, huh? Yeah. That's when you're ready to paint. So you're ready to paint when when the image is faded and your mind. So your mind. Okay. What happens is that your image you still with you. It's just being just being removed from your your total your your sort of conscience. It's sort of being removed to just another level of consciousness. And if you have the knowledge of how to paint, even if whatever level of knowledge you are, if you paint with this image faded in your mind, then your intuition will paint for you. And I believe, my belief is that that's when you will paint at your highest level. Because as soon as you start thinking about how it ought to be, mm -hmm. then I think you, uh, you, you limit yourself. Because and everything is related to a way of sort of performing, or, and you sort of have a goal, and you need to reach a certain level. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't think about it, you can actually do it at your highest level. It's like running down a set of stairs. If you're in a hurry, you run down a set of stairs. You could be running for a train or whatever it might be. You have no problem. You know exactly how to do it. As soon as you start thinking of where to place your feet, you will stumble. Right. It's exactly the same. So we do this all the time. But the trick is to capture your knowledge and your intuition in the way, my way of thinking, because then you never have, intuition never has a bad day, uh, but you personally might have a bad day, but intuition just is, it's just a crystallization of everything you know. So if you can capture that, you will perform at a very, very much higher level than if you concentrate on trying to be best. So it's like the meditation that you do before your art, whatever that art is, is like you're kind of developing, you're already painting the picture in your head and then as you come back to your breathing, it's like clicking file, save as, and then putting that file in the recycling bin and starting over. In principle. And what when, when, when I paint, I could, since 
it's, it's for me is very difficult to keep this image away for more than a few minutes. And my paintings have to go very, very quickly. I mean, they, they don't sure. take more than a few minutes to do everything except for the face, of course, but everything, the shape of the bird, whatever, no matter what size it is. As soon as the image starts coming back in my head, then I start seeing all my mistakes. I start seeing where I, sh- I should have placed it here and this didn't work and this and so forth. All my doubts and fears, which I have tons of, I and mean, I don't think I'm alone with that, come back. And if I were to start correcting these things, the image loses energy and, and, and I start again just trying to reproduce something. Well, if I put down my paintbrush, wait for the paint to dry, I'm always surprised at the result. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes it fun. Since I haven't planned exactly how it's going to be, I do have a very exact image in my mind, but the painting never ends up that way. And, but since, if I don't have in the front of my mind exactly how it's supposed to be, I'm never disappointed. Right. So it, it becomes a, sort of a, a fun way of painting because it, 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 it's a surprise. Now, it, it's a surprise, yes, but how do you know when you're done? Well, first of all, the, the, fa- the, the shape I'm done when, when the image starts coming back. Mm-hmm. Then if there are lots of colors and so forth, maybe I'll have to do the same thing again for the second color because I don't want the colors to mix or whatever. But generally speaking, the paint, the, the shape of the painting is done when, when the image starts coming back and I have to put down the paintbrush. So that determines that. But then I've made all these mistakes in the painting and I have the, the face left to paint. Then I have to figure out how do I place a proper face in this painting that I, with all these mistakes it never ended up the way i thought but since i know the anatomy of a bird i have to sort of find the angle of the face which fits into this particular painting and that's also what uh, determines what attitude this bird is going to have so that the, the so we say that the, the face facial attitude of the bird comes from the painting itself i don't decide that and that becomes always a big surprise uh, and when when the bird sort of looks at me and says hello, then I'm then I'm I'm ready. It, it sort of it, it paints itself in a sense. It says hello. Yeah, I was painting a huge face of a bird. It was enormous, and I was working on the eye very carefully. And I wasn't thinking about it. And I backed up to see what it looked like, and all of a sudden there was somebody there, and then I was done. So it, yeah, it tells me when it's ready rather than the other way around. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, I feel so calm right now. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, could you tell us uh, about your theory um, about the first brush stroke? Mm-hmm. Well, the, it's very related to what we just talked about. The first brush stroke, uh, the Sh- Shita was an, uh, a painter from, the, I believe, the 16th century or maybe 17th uh, China who was a, ma- a master who believed in this holistic paint stroke where you sort of the description of it is that in the beginning, on your page or on your paper, there's nothing. And all of a sudden, you take the paintbrush and you put it to the paper. And there is something there. It's sort of like a big bang kind of uh, approach to it. Because, yeah, from nothing to something. Right. And in best of worlds, then you do this paintbrush without any thought. Without intent, you call it in, in, in the Zen way of thinking. You do it without intent, which sounds a little bit strange. But the point of that is just... You don't have that particular goal in mind when you do it. You just start. And it takes, that's the hard part in a sense, because it takes uh, uh, courage to sit there with an empty piece of paper, a paintbrush full of paint, and just start. I do workshops in Zen calligraphy, and we, we, we do exactly that. And there it's much harder because we're painting nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and people, and I've done it myself, people can sit for you know, 10 minutes without daring to put the brush to the paper. It's just a brush with paint. That's it. So why is it so important what the result is going to be? Sure. So the first, so therefore, if you can go into the first paint stroke full of energy, full of life, then the painting will, will sort of continue from that. It's the same thing with calligraphy for Japanese and, and Chinese uh, ideograms. They say that the first stroke will determine the energy and the attitude of the whole character. And it's the same thing with the painting. If you have a timid paintbrush stroke first, your painting will be timid. If you go at it with full energy, regardless if the paint stroke is soft or hard, but just with all your might, you put it down, it will be easier to continue the painting and sort of take it to its, to its full extent. 
I love that idea, and I think it relates so well to what the goal of this podcast is to uh, to just do that first paint stroke mm. or or type that first word or whatever it is. Yes, it's, it's not. It doesn't have to do with painting necessarily. It has to do with your attitude in any endeavor. Yeah, and to and to come to it with, like you said, with all that energy and uh, mm. not necessarily intention, but just intention to create. Yes, exactly, exactly. Intention to do it, that, and, and whatever happens, and 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 I, who cares who sees it? <laughs> you don't you don't even have to show it to anybody. No, but we are our worst own worst enemies in this respect, and it, it's it's uh, it, that's just the way we are, and and it's not strange, but it's very it, it, one can overcome it. I believe I have a long way to go, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, that leads perfectly into what I wanted to ask you about resistance. Um, what are some things that initially held you back from being creative? And I guess they still do to some extent, but uh, how do you battle that? Well, that's my battle with, with my, first of all, I'm my worst own worst critic, but I, for some reason, have this thought that people are always judging me. So I look at other people for confirmation that I'm doing a good job, for instance. Uh, but even if they say I'm doing a good job, I still don't believe it. And it, 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 I comparing myself to others, I look at other artists and so forth, and I say, well, they're much better than I am, and so forth. And and perhaps I'm doing a lot less now. But I've come to realize that the way of getting past this is to is this exercise, the first that we went through, that way of thinking, of practicing and practicing and practicing, not to sort of hit the target. It's the actual doing that's the creative and the interesting part, and that part which makes you grow, not the result. And if if you believe in what you're doing, uh, I am just sort of saying that if we, if for painting, for instance, if you paint with your heart, we all paint something beautiful. And I believe that's the same thing with everything, whether it's painting or writing or relationships or jobs or whatever. If we do it fully. I mean, doing the dishes, whatever, do it with full heart and full energy, it will result in something good. The, the opposite is to sort of think, what do other people think? And that's one of, for me, the worst thing. I had an exhibit uh, a few years ago, or a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a joint exhibit with others, and one of the painters was uh, Sweden's most famous uh, watercolorist. And when I spoke about this exhibit to people I knew, I said, it's going to be great. I'm going to have an exhibit. I'm going to be part of this group. And then this person is, is on the top of the list. They said, oh, wow, that's amazing. Oh, now you really have to paint your best painting, oh. don't you? And I sort of thought. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess you have to do it. And finally, I got into that state of mind. And I started saying, I've got to paint the best paintings I've ever painted. They have to be it, comparable to this person's painting and I totally blocked I couldn't paint anything that I would show at all until I just sat and waited for this to go away and then I painted and I did some paintings and I liked them <laughs> and I'm on the wall and people bought them and, and liked them and, and so the whole thing and it was even a waste of time because the paintings from this famous painter they were sort of six years old and they were just lent to the show so so it sort of become an anti, became an anticlimax there but i had worked myself up into an absolute tizzy trying to 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 achieve something and that was the actually the only real block i've had and now i know that if i end up in a block just sit with it be with it and just say i'm in a block let it be and just keep painting or not until all of a sudden one day I say, oh, I want to paint something. And all of a sudden I've forgotten that I had this block. So, so comparing yourself to others is just and listening to what others think is good or bad. I think that's a real mistake. I do too. And there really isn't a, You can't compare yourself to others because there's nobody else that's like you and probably nobody else that will ever do the thing that you want to do or the way you want to do it. That's interesting because I, I just thought about when we went over the, this idea of speaking to you, that was really something that, I mean, maybe you don't paint like Da Vinci or, or Robert Motherwell or Edward Hopper or whoever, but one mustn't forget, they can't paint like you. Mm. And that is, I mean, you have to believe that and believe that that is your thing. 
not for anyone else's. It's great to copy the masters to learn, but then when you create on your own, only you can do that. Nobody else can do that. That's a beautiful thought. And nobody will do it unless you do it. <laughs> That's another point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you've, you've told us a, a story about your only block, but can you take us to maybe your best moment creatively? Uh, well, I think the one I did, I described about this big paintbrush was, was probably, that was probably the best moment that I've had, but I have best moments all the time. <laughs> it's, it's really the way that I paint. I, I f- very, very often look at the result after I've painted and not sort of concentrate so much. I just paint it. I, I'm, I'm surprised. I sort of go, wow, did I do that? And it doesn't feel like I did it. So in a sense, the element of surprise, I, I do everything I can to, 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 to sort of create these elements. I, my, my, I have a book that I've written, and it's called A Quest for the Unexpected. And the unexpected is what gives me sort of these moments of, of sort of, wow, this was a lot of fun. Uh, so there was one painting exactly, specifically, which, which it's a tiny little painting of a, of a European blackbird. This is a blackbird with a yellow beak, very beautiful bird. And I thought I had an image in my mind that it's going to be sort of uh, hunched down and sort of so it was with a head sort of tucked in its feathers. And I had a paintbrush full of black paint. It was just a little bit. I paint with very large brushes because I don't want to be sucked into detail with them. So I had this big paintbrush and I painted part of the, of the body. And all of a sudden, a big drop, plop, sort of went just above where I sort of had planned to have the head of this bird. And I thought to myself, well, I, there went that painting. I might as well stop. But then for some reason, I continued and said, well, what? So wait a minute. I wonder what I can do with this. And all of a sudden, I decided, what if I stretch the neck of this bird and make this blob that I had dropped? There's a, I have a lot of splotches on my paintings, but normally they, they, they're fairly small. Mm. But this was sort of a big blob. And so I said, well, what if I make that to the, into the forehead of the bird and stretch its, its neck? And since I know the bird, I can sort of say, well, okay, it can stretch this far. I could just manage to stretch the neck of this bird sort of anatomically correctly so that this blob became the forehead of the bird. Then I had to tilt the head of the bird. And the attitude when I was finished with this bird, I would never, ever have been able to plan the, the sort of the facial expression of this bird and the, and the posture of the bird because it all came out of a mistake. And that was a, a, a moment that was very, very uh, important for me. Because I, now I always finish my paintings, regardless if I think they're going to go, uh, they're not going to work. Because you never know. You never know if it's going to work or not. You never know. And yeah, I think, again, that applies to so many things, too. If you have a block, you're a, a musician or a writer or mm. you know, a painter, mm. you just kind of keep going and it, you think it's trash. Uh, well, finish it to its com- yeah. trash, trashy completion and then reevaluate. Yeah, and who says it's trash? Right, true. Uh, I, th- just one more question too, before we get into our final push, do you, when you look at your paintings, can you still see the first brushstroke? Sometimes, not always. Mm-hmm. It depends a little bit on what happens with the bird and what happens with the painting. But I have a couple of paintings that I have actually recorded the first brushstroke because I sort of look at the first brushstroke and sort of go, wow, that was a nice stroke. And then I quickly take a photograph of that and, 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 and continue and then get back into the yeah because it, it just because once in a while it's it, perhaps it's not um, absolutely true to my to my way of doing it since i ought to not think about it but once in a while i'm so surprised by the brush stroke and also for the educational purposes because i'll be doing books and sometimes i have workshops and so forth so i, I use them a little bit as a learning process or a teaching process also and and uh, a lot of times i can see them at least i can see them sure and I did this film um, on my website. You can see a film. And the first brush stroke there is very, very difficult to see. But the stroke was a, it was a big one. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I did. I watched that video and uh, I recommend everybody go check it out. It will be on our show notes page, which can be found at yourcreativepush.com slash Carl Martins. I have to ask you about that video too, because you, you do see you making that first brush stroke and you see mm. your physical position as you're doing it 
leaning over like that mm. with the the large paper on the floor does does your back hurt by the end of of the day no not anymore <laughs> no i think it's good for, it's good for my back actually to, to do that i'm i'm I, I sit on the floor get up and, and sit down and get up and sit down and bend over and sit down and get up and straighten up all day long so I'm, i've sort of worked up those muscles i think it's good for you to move around yeah, that was. I was like, man, that looks uncomfortable. <laughs> no, it's 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 pretty. It's quite alright. Now, for me, it's okay. Uh, I highly recommend going to check out that video. It's it's not long. I believe it's like six minutes, yeah. and uh, it's it's really great. Look into your creative process, hmm. uh, Carl. What does your art and creativity bring to your life? It's really. I don't do it for the art. I really don't do it for the art. It's wonderful that people see it as art and they buy it and so forth, uh, which, of course, is wonderful. So I make a living out of it. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is it's a practice ground for overcoming my fears. That's what it's for. And I think it helps a little bit. Like a battleground. It's a battleground and a practice ground because it's it's safe. But it it still still brings out my fears and my doubts and all my sort of weaknesses. but I can do it in sort of a closed area. And the result is something that I can use in my life. Who is your greatest inspiration? Oh, wow. That's changed over the years. But as a young person painting, uh, John Fenwick Lansdowne, uh, his Canadian painter who paints birds, was my absolute inspiration. But, but then again, all my life, and, but specifically now when I've started looking more at Asian painters, the Zen painters, there's a Zen painter called Nan Tembo, for many, for a few centuries ago. Uh, and then there's a, I bumped into a, a Chinese painter called Chao Shao An, uh, who is who is an amazing painter from, I think he's from Hong Kong, actually. Um, so since since my painting comes from the calligraphy and the 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 um, Asian painters, of course, have a big influence on me. But there are Swedish painters, one called Skager Fosch, uh, who um, actually also inspired me very much to take this step into sort of more free painting. Carl, now we're going to get into the final push, where I ask you to reach through the microphone, grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that maybe you have inspired today, and is thinking, maybe I could do this too, and give them your best advice and give them a push to do it. I think the only advice I can give is believe in what you're doing. Don't let other things influence you. If you can, I know it's very difficult, but believe in what you're doing and just do it. And don't be so concerned with comparisons, just like I mentioned before. And specifically working on your expectations some wise person said expectations are disappointments created by yourself. Try to not have those expectations. Like, like I said, if you paint from your heart, you will paint something beautiful, and, and you just have to work on believing that. And I think that's the, the, the key to any success, because you can't plan success. It comes when, you're ready, when it's ready for you. So that's all I can say beautiful and uh like i said i this has been a very calming interview and i just i want to go paint right now i want to <laughs> write i want to just do something creative and i want to meditate before i do it you this has been an extremely inspiring interview wonderful carl thank you so much for being on the show and giving us that push today well thank you for letting me be on the show of course it was an absolute pleasure and you can find carl on his website um which is carlmartins.se K-A-R-L-M-A-R-T-E-N-S dot S-E. And you can also find him on Facebook. Just search Carl Martins. Carl, thanks again. Thank you. What an awesome episode. Don't you feel calm? Um, And I have to tell you that I felt so inspired after that conversation that I just did work after the interview for like an hour and a half. And I just wrote. I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And I did it as he said i without really thinking about the process of it just sitting down finding that that space and then just kind of shooting the arrow and it's interesting because i hadn't written in uh, probably two months because i've been working on this podcast getting trying to get guests on etc all the things that go behind the scenes so it inspired me 
So hopefully it inspires you as well. And as I said in the show, be sure to check out the show notes page for that video. of uh, It's a short video of Carl showing the process of painting. Um, and it's really eye-opening and it really gives you a, a better look into um, his process visually. And while you're on the show notes page, be sure to check out all the resources that Carl was, was kind enough to send me after the interview um, with various artists that have inspired him and his work. Definitely worth checking out. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for subscribing. And thank you especially for your ratings and reviews on iTunes. They go so far into helping to push this show to more people. And there's actually money involved for you if you'd like. So check out yourcreativepush.com slash contest to see how your ratings and reviews can put some money in your pocket. On tomorrow's show, we have Ari Leff, a.k.a. Lauv. And that's tomorrow, but hopefully today you have been pushed hard enough to go and get your work done. So get out there and do it. Do it.